Our next speaker is Valerie Jameson. Valerie Jameson is features editor at New Scientist and a former particle physicist. Her journey into the world of boringology was featured in Nothing from Absolute Zero to Cosmic Oblivion. Uh, please welcome Valerie Jameson. Thank you, this is my first time and it's great to be here. New scientists' offices are, are just across the road and, uh, and this is where Boringology originated, right across the road. Um, boringology is the science of boring and uh, at New Scientist we were throwing around some ideas of uh, you know, new articles that we would uh, cover. And um, we had this great idea of why not look into the science of the boring. What's it like watching paint dry? Does ditch water really deserve its dreary reputation? How we laughed at this. How funny it would be to send some poor hapless writer off on an assignment to cover these really dull and dreary things. Sadly, that person was me. Um, which is um, why I found myself um, here. Standing on a field, sinking into the mud, plastic bags tied around my feet on a really dull, dreary November day, looking at grass to watch grass grow. <laughs> now, I hope this picture gives you a sort of flavour of actually how interesting grass might be. You can probably tell already from this picture, from a grass research centre in Aberystwyth, that there's a bit of variety in these different patches of grass. Some patches are greener than others, for example. And, um, and in fact, there is a huge variety amongst grasses. There are 9,000 varieties of grass. Each one is very, very different. And uh, you know, if you have a, a lawn or a park, then uh, you want a grass that has lots of dense shoots and that grows rather slowly so that you don't have to mow it very often. But if you're a farmer, and there are some sheep in the field behind, both it being whales, of course, then um, you want grass that grows very, very quickly. Uh, and so the uh, grass breeders uh, in Aberystwyth at the Grass Research Centre, they do all kinds of um, science on genetics and studying the grass to try and understand these different breeds. There's even a grass called giant miscanthus. This is it here. It grows four metres a year. Um, and, uh, and in fact, it grows so quickly, you can even hear it crackle as it grows. Um, and you can't in Wales because it's windy and your know, grass is just blowing around you. But this is what giant miscanthus looks like. And this giant miscanthus is used as a, as a biofuel. You can take this grass and turn it into ethanol and, and power your cars. But that doesn't answer the question, how do you watch grass grow? Um, so um, back in the lab, um, I looked at um, one of these. This is a um, rye grass. And um, grasses, the, the, although all these grasses look very different, there's something very common about them. Grass grows from the bottom up. There are little, all the little cells at the bottom of the grass. They, um, they divide and so on. And this is quite unlike other plants. Other plants, the new leaves um, come out from the top. But for grass, it grows from the bottom. It's like squeezing a tube of toothpaste and the grass pops up. So to watch how grass grows, what you do is you, um, you attach a little clip to that uh, top leaf uh, with a little wire on the end, which you hang over a pulley and let a little weight drop down. And, um, and, then, you, and then you just... Um, you can, this, this little weight, you can measure um, how it drops as the grass grows um, by, uh, by measuring its drop through a little uh, digital voltmeter. And I just waited in the lab and waited and waited and suddenly this little digital, digital reading flickered into life and I was watching grass grow in front of my very eyes. Now this little guy grew at um, three and a half millimeters every hour. And um, on my way back from Aberystwyth, a rather dull and dreary five-hour journey back to Oxfordshire, where I live, that grass grew 17 and a half millimetres overnight. Amazing, amazing. So that was the first leg of my journey into the dull. The second took me 
um, here. Rather unpromising to watch, uh, to have a look at ditch water. <laughs> I think you can safely say from this photograph that this is not a promising assignment. This does not look interesting. It looks a rather hopeless and forlorn place. However, here we go. So you can see the water is remarkably clear, as I said. Um, and you can see the little things just zipping around. These are just blobs of algae. The, um, the long strandy thing that you can see, this thing here, that was, a, that was a cyanobacteria, which gives pond life its uh, sort of blue, blue sheen. These are diatoms. They're not creatures. They're, um, they're algae that uh, take in the nutrients and build a hard shell around them. That's what that triangular thing is as well. That's a diatom. Oh, there's a nematode just wriggling there, very, very small. Um, now what you'll see are blobs of, um, these are the algae that are just bouncing around. They're looking for light. They're heading towards the light of the microscope, trying to photosynthesize. And again, more diatoms. It's strangely hypnotic, isn't it? More diatoms just um, appearing into view there. And that long, big thing that you can see there, that's just a blade of grass. So, um, and that's pond life. Th this is actually, this is actually a very boring video because it just consists of um, algae and plankton. It doesn't have the creatures in there. The, the creatures that you can find in there are fascinating for evolutionary biologists um, and are creatures that can survive all sorts of different conditions. Um, ditch water is actually, when you look at it under a microscope, it's surprisingly clear. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, ditch water is full of little creatures called zooplankton, which um, they uh, swim around in the water, taking all the nutrients that have flown in from the grass around it, and, uh, and they then excrete these little particles out, which fall down as sediment, and that means that the water is much, much clearer. Um, also within that, you'll see sort of these strands of amazing cyanobacteria. You'll see little uh, um, transparent creatures zooming around. Um, you'll see um, really, really strange structures called diatoms that take the nutrients. And you'll see all sorts of little blobs of algae that ping around at the same time. Which brings me to the, the final leg of my journey, which was um, watching paint dry. Um, this is, the, uh, this is the wall that I sit next to in my office. I think you'll agree that it's, um, well, it's painted with a, a, a matte emulsion. Um, I think you might agree it's also time that it was um, painted again. Um, and um, paint is actually, it's, it's very fascinating. It is, um, matte emulsion is actually made of lots of um, spheres um, of polymers and um, they are suspended in water. And when paint dries, what happens is um, it's the water evaporating. If you've got gloss, it's the same thing goes on, but it's instead of water, it's a solvent. And um, as the water evaporates, all those spheres move together and squish together to form a film. It's a bit like if you're trying to cram a load of blown up balloons into a box and they all cram together and they form this, um, this film. And um, now I'm, I have paint drawing the movie on the next slide. I'm, I'm, I'm hope it works. When I when I told the people at Asco Nobel who make Dulux paint that I was going on this journey to watch paint dry in a in a laboratory in Oxford, they told me, "Pay attention. All the interesting stuff will happen in the first 20 minutes." <laughs> and it does. Um, what you can actually see, what you see happening is as the water evaporates, all those spheres come together. It all happens, does happen remarkably quickly. Now, why, would, what, why do researchers do this? Why do they look at paint dry? Well, they're always trying to develop new types of paint. Uh, so paints that are more durable, for example, paints that are more environmentally <coughs> friendly. And, uh, and so that's why, um, that's why uh, they, they have these. Now, paint drawing the movie, I mean, y you're not going to go and pay £25 to go and see it at uh, Leicester Square. Um, but um, plenty of researchers do. Um, cows, um, 
the milk that they produce depends on, uh, on what they eat. And you can actually um, change what cows produce by what you feed them. Cows fed on clover, for example, produce milk that's bursting full of polyunsaturates. It's almost like cows make margarine, can you believe, rather than butter. Um, there's a type of grass called stay green grass, which, guess what, it stays green, even in drought conditions or if it's buried under snow. Um, nematode worms, um, these uh, in the, the um, ditch water, nematode worms are a really important part of ditch life. Um, don't diss the ditch, I tell you. They, um, they, um, these nematode worms, they turn up anywhere where it's moist. Um, sperm whales sadly have parasitic worms that grow 10 metres long. Um, another type of nematode worm lives in uh, vinegar. There are 2,000 different species of these nematode worms. My favourite is the one that lives in beer mats. Um, and paint, paint, although all that action happens in the first 20 minutes, um, paint continues to harden for a week after it dries. Um, I could go on, but obviously I don't want to bore you. Um, so, if you do want to find out more about, um, about my journey into boringology, and, uh, and if you can be bothered, um, please do buy uh, our new scientist book, Nothing. Thank you. Thank you.